A warm welcome to today's talk, Wednesday the 9th of November. Now, there's a debate going on in the UK Parliament about the safety of COVID vaccinations. Now, I'm unable to comment on uh, a lot of the detail here because of my own um, ignorance on this matter. But thankfully, in the UK, we live in a parliamentary democracy and members of Parliament are completely free to voice their opinions and everything I'm going to play is already on YouTube uh, on the parliamentary channel. So some interesting views are expressed and I would encourage you to listen to this video uh, if you can. Uh, some people might think that the risk benefit analysis has now changed. Now I'm going to start off with a very brief clip from Mr Elliot uh, Colburn member of parliament and let's just see what he has to say this only lasts about a minute so so please stick please stick with it there's some important stuff coming up here 602171 relating to the safety of the covid-19 vaccines uh, on behalf of the petitions committee i will read out the prayer of this petition which states that there has been a significant increase in heart attacks and related health issues since the rollout of the covid-19 vaccines this needs immediate and full scientific investigation to establish if there's any possible link with the COVID-19 vaccination rollout. It is the duty of government to ensure that the prescribed medical interventions of its response to coronavirus are safe. We believe that the recent and increasing volume of data relating to cardiovascular problems since the COVID-19 vaccine rollout began is enough to warrant a full public inquiry. This petition has amassed over 107,000 signatures, including signatories from my own car short and a Wallington constituency. And I'd like to first begin by putting on record my gratitude to the petitions committee clerks and the team behind the scenes for organising today's debate, but also particularly the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, or MHRA, who met with me recently to brief me on their vaccine safety surveillance strategy. Now, Sir Roger, throughout the course of my speech, I'll be pointing out why I do not think that the government should be launching a public inquiry into vaccine safety. I think it would be a waste of taxpayers' money, and I do not think it is necessary for reasons that I will go through throughout the course of my speech. But just to give a bit of background, Sir Roger, the COVID-19 vaccine has been at the centre of... OK, so that, that was Mr. Elliot... Uh, that was Mr. Elliot Colburn... A member of Parliament. Now he's been fully briefed by the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, an official government body that gives advice on these things. Now I do seem to remember a video a couple of days ago where we did note that the uh, MHRA is 86% uh, funded by the pharmaceutical industry and other vested, uh, I mean in, and other uh, industries. Um, so that's not going to influence them at all, of course. We're not saying that, but that is where he gets his information from. And, and the full uh, line of his argument is there on the, uh, the government uh, channel. Now I'm going to go and listen to Mr. Danny Kruger, Member of Parliament for uh, Devices. And Mr. Kruger uh, gives information that I personally am... Uh, uh, personally am... Um, ignorant of so it's good of him to uh, to give it uh, because i can't remember so um let's listen to uh, to mr danny kruger now this goes on for a few minutes we might chat about it in the way th in the minute in the part way through but let, let, let just give him the time because he says things that i can't i can't um remember so over to uh, mr uh, danny uh, danny kruger now i do regret his 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 response to my honorable friend, member for Christchurch, I think, who, who, who raised the point about uh, medical expertise, which cast some doubt on the vaccines. Um, and, and my friend chose to smear all opponents of the vaccine programme. Um, there, of course, are lunatics out there who are making absurd and outrageous claims, but I do suggest that there are many reasonable and respectable people who have anxieties about the vaccine programme, and, uh, and particularly, of course, in their own cases, those of themselves and their families who have suffered as a result of the programme. Um, and I, I, I'm a member of the, the All Party Parliamentary Group, my friend, member for Christchurch chairs, looking at vaccine injuries. And we met, I think there was the first meeting of the APPG last week in committee room uh, in Portcullis House. And we met there, it was only, a, I'm afraid, a tiny handful of colleagues, but 
well over 100 members of the public attended, which isn't the usual uh, story for, a, uh, for an APPG. And I felt somewhat ashamed on behalf of Parliament. This was the first time that those members of uh, the public families of the bereaved, themselves injured uh, citizens, had had the opportunity to be in a room with, with members of this House. And I'm very pleased that we are now having this debate, and I'm particularly pleased to, that, that, that we have the opportunity for members of the public to hear from the Minister about, about this topic. Um, and I should say to members of the public watching that we have here a very good Minister who is genuinely committed to, uh, to, to health and to public health, uh, and has shown a real interest in in this topic and in the effect of, of COVID policy since before when she was a backbench MP. And I would say that the UK as a whole, and while many questions need to be answered about, about our COVID response, is by no means the worst offender. We're not Canada or New Zealand or China, places where they think they can exterminate COVID by depriving the population of the most basic civil liberties. Um, but we still do have, I'm afraid, much to ask questions to ask ourselves and even much to be ashamed of. I'm particularly ashamed, and I put it on record in hindsight, of my own vote to dismiss the care workers uh, who didn't want to take the vaccine. Uh, and I very much hope that the 40,000 care workers who lost their jobs can be reinstated and indeed compensated. Uh, now, a group of us, including, I think, the, the minister, held out against compulsory vaccination of health workers when that was proposed by the government last winter. And uh, and that resistance, I think, turned the tide to a degree on government policy. Uh, and, we, and we emerged from, the, from, from lockdowns quicker than we might have otherwise. And yet we still have this policy of mass vaccination. And I, want to, I, I do want to query, query this on behalf of, of constituents who have written to me. And my, my query starts with this simple point. In October uh, 2020, when the vaccine was getting ready for rollout, Kate Bingham, the head of the vaccines agency, said this. There's going to be no vaccination of people under 18. It's an adult-only vaccine for people over 50, yeah. focusing on health workers and care home workers and the vulnerable. Now, why was it extended to the whole population? I don't think we've ever had a completely satisfactory answer to that, to that question. Uh, and I raise it because my concern is that in extending the vaccination program, it, it became an operation in public persuasion an operation in which dissent is unhelpful or even immoral, justifying suppression, even vilification of those who raise concerns. Give Happy to give way. I thank my honourable friend for giving way. Would he also question, unlike any other vaccine, um, the vaccine was actually given to people who'd got natural immunity because they'd actually contracted, provably contracted the virus, and so they would have had natural immunity. Why were those people vaccinated? My honourable friend is absolutely right. The best vaccine against COVID is COVID. And, uh, and many people were indeed naturally immune, and, and I think there are questions to be asked about the effects of vaccination on the, immunity, on the immune system. Um, so, now I do understand why. My, my honourable friend, the member for Castle and Wallingford, made, made, made a very you know, understandable point about the importance of, uh, a, 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 of resisting misinformation. And certainly, there, as, I, as I mentioned, many crazy theories out there which we need to not, not, not give credence to. Um, if we're talking about a programme of vaccinating the population, it is important that the public is persuaded to do what the government wants them to do. And I understand why the government should have a public health information campaign along those lines. But it, it is an essential principle of medical ethics that people need to be able to give their informed consent before any treatment. And I do worry about how we can say that consent was fully informed in all cases. Throughout there has been not, I wouldn't say deliberate, but there has been some misinformation, it turned possibly accidental in favour of the vaccine. We can tell this with hindsight. Um, perhaps the most egregious, and my, the, the doctor that my honourable friend mentioned earlier presented on this to the, uh, to the APPG last week, Dr Malhotra, the, the claim that the vaccine is 95% effective. And what that means is simply the relative risk, not the actual absolute risk, uh, reduction in risk to an individual. The absolute risk reduction is really less than 1%. There was a widespread claim that the vaccine stops transmission so people should take the jab to protect other people. We were all told that. We all believed that for many months. Last month, we heard from Pfizer that, that, Pfizer, that their vaccine was never tested to see whether it would stop transmission. Uh, and yet we had the notorious claim by, by Professor Chris Whitty that even though the vaccine brought no benefit to children, children should be vaccinated to protect wider society. Now, I'm all for thinking about society, not the individual, uh, Sir Roger, but that, again, it feels to me a profound break with medical ethics. 
And a lot of people are asking what the vaccine does to children and young people. And Dr. Whitty is right that the benefit to healthy children seems to be essentially nil. Uh, and yet there are genuine questions to be asked. And I do not verify these questions. I merely ask them on behalf of my constituents. How do we explain the increase in the rates of myocarditis, the increase in heart attacks and the excess deaths among young people? And indeed in the general population, it is plausible, not definitive, but plausible, uh, that the vaccine is responsible for more harms than we know about. And I mentioned in my intervention earlier uh, that we know from the yellow card scheme that up to one in 200 people vaccinated report an adverse reaction. And that is in itself bad enough. But we also know uh, that yellow card reports, uh, the, 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 the adverse effects are significantly underreported through the yellow card scheme. Based on the MHRA's own research, there may be as many as 10 times more serious adverse reactions, serious ones, not just any ones. There may be 10 times more serious adverse reactions than the yellow card system shows. Happy to give way. Does he agree with me that it's, not, um, it's, it's perhaps important for the minister to explain how those people who ha say they've experienced damage from the vaccine can have themselves heard, not just via the yellow card scheme, not just via the module in the public or existing public inquiry, and not just an application for vaccine damage compensation, that there needs to be more meaningful ways in which people can engage um, with, with their experiences of, of damage. I'm very grateful to the Honourable Aid, and I, I, I absolutely agree. And I think that, that, that today is a very important moment for, for the Minister to hear on, from our members here on behalf of residents. And I would encourage a far greater engagement with, uh, with uh, citizens who have themselves suffered from uh, vaccine damage or even lost loved ones through it. Now, uh, I mentioned these, these rather terrifying uh, facts, and, and there may be innocent explanations for them, and I, I very much hope they are. If these are conspiracy theories, we need them to be comprehensively and courteously debunked. So I have four questions for the Minister to close, Sir Roger. First, will she review the vaccination of children? We know that children have strong naturally acquired immunity and that the chance of death from COVID for a healthy child is only is one in two million. So I believe that we should follow other countries like Denmark and stop vaccinating children altogether. But I invite the Minister to consider reviewing that aspect of the policy. Second, will she make representations in government and with Baroness Hallett that the terms of reference for her inquiry should be broadened to explicitly include the efficacy and safety of the vaccines? And I hear what my honourable friend says is absolutely right, that the inquiry does include reference to the, uh, to the vaccination programme and its effects. And he may well be right that that is sufficient and that the review will properly consider the, just the, the topics that we're discussing today. I hope that that is the case. I, I, but I think that needs to be made more explicit. And so I'd invite the Minister to comment. Happy to give way. I actually wrote to Baroness Hallett asking her to make, ensure that it was specifically in the terms of reference that it should cover the issue of safety of, of vaccines and the impact of vaccines. And as a result of not just my representations but representations from others, the terms of reference were amended to make it quite clear that vaccines and the impact of vaccines and the potential damage of vaccines is included within the terms of reference. Well, for that clarification, it concerns me that it took his representations to even get the, the, vaccine, yeah. the, the, the effect of the vaccines considered by the inquiry. And I, I suggest we need to go further and talk about efficacy and safety, not just the impact. So I think we need to be quite explicit about what we want answers to. These, these issues need to be directly covered. Um, now, this inquiry, I think, uh, I think we do need the public inquiry to consider this because of the compromised nature of medical reg regulation in our country. And I mentioned earlier that the MHRA is funded by the pharmaceutical companies who produce the drugs and vaccines that it regulates. And this might be, there might be some universe in which this makes sense, but I don't think this is that universe. I don't think it's right. Um, and third, we need to do more, a lot more for the injured and bereaved. And as my, the Honourable Lady mentioned, I agree with all of my... Uh, my friend from Christchurch's uh, recommendations, and we'll hear from him shortly about what needs to be done to raise the threshold for compensation for the injured and the speed of payouts. And I also agree with him that we need clinics for people with adverse reactions, just as we do for people with long COVID. And finally, following this, we need to change the power and balance. I am sorry on behalf of Parliament that this is the first proper debate we've had on this subject. I regret that victims and families have had to struggle so hard to get the engagement of the system. I hope the Minister will agree to meet with some of the people who are here today and, and, other, and other representatives of, 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 of families affected by, by the vaccines um, with a prop, for a proper exchange of information and ideas. And I hope that she will request that Dame June Rain of the MHRA meets with them as well, rather than, I'm afraid to say, ignoring letters <coughs> for months. 
And I want to hope that, uh, end by hoping that with the new government that takes over this week, the current minister herself has only just been recently appointed, will stay in post and that we can start a new chapter uh, in the story of COVID. No more remote power telling people what to do. Let's put truth and justice back into our public life and restore trust in the experts we rely on. Thank you, Sir Roger. Well, we should be all right. We should be all right for time. But, uh, okay. Um, thanks for bearing with us on that. Um, Danny Kruger there was saying quite a few things that I can't, uh, I can't remember. So um, questions that need answered, Mr. Kruger thinks. Changes... Uh, in opinion with ongoing evidence. I'm delighted to see that Mr. Kruger has changed his opinion with ongoing evidence. Um, when we get new uh, evidence, of course, we should amend our views with that evidence. Learning is, is a process of evolution. And evolution just means change. And we need to follow the evidence wherever it leads. October 2020, the original plan was only to vaccinate older people to protect them. That seems to have changed, the Mr. Kruger observes. Um, now, Mr. Kruger thinks uh, the best vaccine against COVID is COVID. That's a direct quote from uh, Mr. Kruger. Uh, to, just his view, of course, but he thinks the best vaccine against COVID is COVID. Natural immunity. And of course, we know from this channel, if you look back at the videos I did pre-2020, I did a whole series of about 20 videos on immunity. The way that the body develops natural immunity when it's exposed to infection. And an amazing system it is. Informed consent and medical ethics, who can argue with that? It's motherhood and apple pie, isn't it? And yet, has it always been done, is a question that Mr. Kruger is raising. Uh, he mentioned uh, Dr. Asim Malhotra, who pointed out the difference between relative risk and absolute risk, which was really quite profound. And um, Dr. Malhotra, of course, was kind enough to come on this channel uh, last week. Questions for Professor Dr. Witte, uh, Chief Medical Officer Still. Uh, knighted uh, for his services to uh, services during the um, pandemic. Uh, seems to have gone a bit quiet now, so it'd be good to get him up front and answering questions. In fact, I think he should answer questions from anyone, but that's just my view. Uh, Mr. Kruger feels that some of these facts are rather terrifying. Again, just his view, but he does say they're facts and some are rather terrifying. And of course, he wants to get rid of the conspiracy theories he wants to debunk that which is not true promote that which is true so um pretty uh pr pretty profound uh speech there from uh, from mr danny kruger member of parliament for devices and um i know that's gone on a bit but he said a lot of things there that i can't uh, i couldn't have remembered to say so um thank you for uh mr kruger's input there and of course thank you for watching